I loved the end of the SNL sketch where you called for goodness in this country. You called for forgiveness, a message that I think so many people are wanting to hear right now. I wonder in a position like yours where you do have, you support the president and you don't agree with everything, but support a lot of the policies, how you grapple with having your character mm -hmm. and reading his tweets and seeing how he can't accept, he can't apologize for things, he can't accept when he's wrong. How do you grapple with just that character? How do you support a guy when you're so different? Well, I support his policy agenda. I don't have to support every character flaw that he has. You know, we can we can have multiple ideas in our head at the same time, right? And I, I don't I don't have to try and defend his character flaws because they are. <laughs> they don't, and it does make it does make the call for civility more difficult. Um, and, and 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 I set a baseline after after the SNL thing. Why? What I wrote in the Washington Post was just don't insult each other, mm -hmm. right? You know, attack ideas. Then let's go after those ideas wholeheartedly. I know I do, but. You don't have to insult, and you don't have to. You don't have to make disingenuous attempts to undermine character. The president's and, not listening to you, though. <laughs> nobody is. <laughs> I'm not sure anybody no. is these days. No. You know, I, I'm not, not going to pretend that it's gotten better. But if we can all be part of the solution, I think. And, I, and again, that's a low bar. Just don't insult each other. But you know, you look. You look at any member of Congress's Twitter feed. All it is is insults. It's they, not just that, comments. though. Was you know, but what caused that miracle? I thought about this a lot too. What are those cultural narratives? that create a sustainable society well one is personal responsibility and we don't always talk about why that's important though so personal responsibility is important because if you don't have it you're not empowered and if you're disempowered well then you're depressed and you're not contributing and if you're not personally responsible then by definition you believe others should be responsible for you and therefore you have to infringe on their freedoms or you have to ask someone else to infringe on their freedoms meaning the government because you put all your faith in government because politicians kept telling you that we were going to solve all your problems, and then your problems didn't get solved exactly how you thought they should. So you elect a new politician who will promise more ways to solve your problems. Then everybody's depressed because their problems don't solve because we asked the government to do it. We asked an impossible job. We forgot about personal responsibility. We forgot about the fact that we own our own destiny. A society starts to believe that, that they're not in charge of their own destiny. Well, society's not going to survive. We don't have that much longer. The second thing you need is basic mental toughness and discipline. This idea that you're going to forego pleasure. You're going to forego gratification because you're disciplined. And because you want to compete like a mentally tough person, you need to compete in a free society. People who are weak-minded can't compete in a free society. They can't do what you do in business. And you have more and more people like that who don't value that, who value victimhood instead. And you see that in this outrage culture that we have all around us. If you don't start to value mental toughness, then again, our society starts to decay. Third thing is loyalty. Loyalty to our country. A sense of duty to your country. And a sense, of, a sense that the things that bring us together, they're not many of them. It's not skin color. It's not religion. It's not heritage. Everybody can become an American. That's what's really cool about America. But there are certain things that bring us together, whether it's the Pledge of Allegiance or the National Anthem or the flag or history, our founding documents, those bring us together. We forget about that. We forget about the meaning of a pluribus unum. But if we don't have that, and if you don't care about that, then it's actually not surprising that you might be for open borders. Because why? Who cares? You don't care about the sovereignty of a country. You don't even care about your nationhood. The fourth thing is virtue and where that virtue comes from. And it comes from God. It has to. Because if it doesn't, if morality just comes from yourself, then it's just an opinion. And if morality is an opinion, then it can be changed at any moment. And if it can be changed at any moment, then you do get secular socialist societies. And we do see the horrors that we have seen in the last hundred years with Nazism and communism and Maoism and the, and the like. That's secularism. That's what happens when humans decide that they know morality better than God and that they place that morality in government. And the last thing is liberty. And the... And, the, and we don't need to ex explain liberty to you, really, but I, but I would point out that you can't have li liberty without all of those things I just mentioned. You just can't. Because liberty isn't exactly freedom. Freedom just means do whatever you want. Liberty is freedom within a set of rules, and you can't be free people without moral virtue, because how can we trust you with freedom if you're not good? That's why, that's why we write, in God we trust, on our coins and on the house floor. That's why it's so important. That's why personal responsibility is so important because that leads to liberty. 
These things are, these things are connected. You can't escape them. And that's what America is about. Those things, they led to the, to the founding documents where we took all the best ideas that humankind have ever had, that moral truth from Jerusalem and reason from Athens and sense of law from Rome and checks and balances from London. And we talked and we, and we put those all together. We wrote them down in Philadelphia and we came up with the best idea that humankind had ever had, which was America. And that led to the miracle we have today. And we can't let that go. We must be grateful for it. I think that's why we meet here in places like this, to be grateful for the miracle that is the United States of America. Elderly woman outside of Planned Parenthood. People yeah. can see the whole clip. And you tweeted that it was, I want to make sure I have this right, that a great example of how to teach young men not to act. Now, back on The View, you talked about criticizing ideas as opposed to insulting people in uh, mm -hmm. today's political dialogue. And I agree. But let me also say, I mean, you really called uh, Sim's character into question here, which I don't think is out of line. How do you decide when that's appropriate and how to dif differentiate that kind of a soul sort of criticism versus an insult? Because that was pretty, I mean, that, that was yeah. pretty rough. I, don't, I still, I don't think that was an insult. If I, if I had said, um, it's a good question. And the way I would differentiate it was I was actually still attacking his actions. Yes. So this is how not, saying this is how not to act. Uh, this is a great example of how not to act. I didn't say, I didn't say this is a great example of who not to be, mm -hmm. you know? I didn't, I didn't say that he's not manly, even though his actions were very much not manly. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, to, to, I mean, God, what he did is just, I, I'm so glad that this blew up all over the media. Uh, and well, conservative media, I have, still haven't seen it on the news, unfortunately. But uh, I Do mean, you think it, it, it would really be in the gross. news if you'd have done something, if you'd have tried to dox women? Oh, yeah. my gosh. It, of course. Of course. I mean, it's not even a question. Uh, and the way he did it was just so vicious and and unrelenting. You know, Trey, I'm trying to dox underage girls. That's that's terrible. And the way he just harassed this old lady for for eight full minutes. I mean, like, what are you thinking? And, and I brought that up. You know, this is what how not to teach your young boys to act, because, you know, I think a lot of us would agree that there is there is a cultural trend towards uh, to, uh, where we're not teaching young boys how to act. No. Uh, whether it's with respecting women or respecting your elders or whatever the case is. And this is, this is, this is a consequence of losing sight of traditional values uh, and, and more generally speaking. Um, this is a consequence of attacking chivalry. You know, in, in your more liberal circles, you're going to say, well, don't hold the door open for me. I could, women will say that. Right. Uh, well, also Dubai, but yes. What, 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 are you, what, are you, what are you creating when you attack these kind of values? I mean, you're you're, you're, you're creating a moment like this where, where it's okay for this, this guy, Brian Sims, to go up and, and, and treat people like that just because they have a different I, idea or they disagree with him on something. I mean, it was just such a vicious video. Another one of your freshman colleagues, uh, Ilan Omar, uh, you've been very critical of her uh, in a video in which she appeared to say that some people did some bad things on mm -hmm. September 11th. Um, you have come under criticism, though, for that video not telling the entire story, taken out of context. Do you have any regrets about that criticism? No, and there's no indication that it was ever taken out of context. The broader point that she was making is perfectly fine. The broader point she was making was that uh, that organization CARE defends civil liberties and that there was, there was a concern about civil liberties post 9-11. That doesn't change the fact that you refer to 9-11 in a dismissive way, both in tone and in gesture and in words as some people did something, all right? All I said was that's unbelievable that you would refer to it that way. And I stand by that wholeheartedly. There, there, there's, no, there's no extra context there. To say it was taken out of context would, would, would infer that she meant something else, that she didn't mean 9-11 when she said some people did something, but clearly we know she did, so. She has said that she's gotten a lot of death threats. I mean, are you concerned about that? Should always be concerned about death threats. I get death threats. Um, it's, it's, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's part of the nature of this job, um, but anybody who would ever threaten a member of Congress should, uh, you know, is, is a horrible human being, it, enough said about that, and we should always be concerned about that. But it is not anybody else's words that caused, caused these things. It is her words, okay? And you, you, can't, you can't lay that blame on anybody else. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas for five minutes, Mr. Crenshaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for some of the, some of the thoughtful discussion on, on how you combat terrorism online. I think there's worthy debates uh, to be had there. Um, and there's, there's good questions on whether some of this content provides education so that we know of the bad things out there or whether it's radicalizing people.
those are hard, those are hard discussions to have, and, and I don't know that we're going to solve them today. But the problem is, is that the testimony doesn't stop there. The, the policies at your social media companies do not stop there. It doesn't stop at the clear-cut lines of terrorism and terrorist videos and terrorist propaganda. Unfortunately, that's not exactly what we're talking about. It goes much further than that. It goes down the slippery slope of what speech is appropriate for your platform and the vague standards that you employ in order to decide what is appropriate. And this is especially concerning given the recent news and the recent leaked emails from Google. They show that labeling mainstream conservative media as Nazis is a premise upon which you operate. It's not even a question according to those emails. The emails say, given that, Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, and Dennis Prager are Nazis. Given that that's a premise, what do we do about it? Two of three of these people are Jewish, very religious Jews, and yet you think they're Nazis. It, it, it begs the question, what kind of education do people at Google have? So they think that religious Jews are Nazis? Three of three of these people had family members killed in the Holocaust. Ben Shapiro is the number one target of the alt-right, and yet you people operate off the premise that he's a Nazi. It's pretty disturbing. And it gets to the question, do you believe in hate speech? How do you define that? Do you, can you give me a quick definition right now? Is it written down somewhere, Google? Can you give me a definition of hate speech? Congressman, yes. So hate speech, again, as updated in our guidelines now, extends to uh, uh, superiority over protected groups to justify discrimination, violence, and so on, based on uh, a number of defining characteristics, whether that's uh, race, sexual orientation, veteran status. Do you have an example of Ben Shapiro or Jordan Peterson or Dennis Prager engaging in hate speech? Do you have one example off the top of your head? So, Congressman, we evaluate individual piece of content based on that content rather than based on the speaker. Okay. Let's, let's get to the next question. Do you believe speech can be violence? All right. No, there's, there's not, not can you incite violence. That is very clearly not protected. But can speech just be violence? Do you believe that speech that isn't specifically calling for violence can be labeled violence and therefore harmful to people? Is that possible? Congressman, I'm not sure I fully understand the distinction you're drawing. Certainly, again, incitement to violence or things that are encouraging right. dangerous behavior, those are things that would be against our policies. Here's, here's, here's the thing. When you call somebody a Nazi, you can make the argument that you're inciting violence, and here's how. As a country, we all agree that Nazis are bad. We actually invaded an entire continent to defeat the Nazis. It's normal to say, hashtag punch a Nazi, because there's this common thread among this, in this country that they're bad and that they're evil and that they should be destroyed. So when you're operating off of that premise, and it's a, frankly, it's a, it's a good premise to operate on, well, what you're implying then is that it's okay to use violence against them. When you label them, when one of the most powerful social media companies in the world labels people as Nazis, you can make the argument that's inciting violence. What you're doing is wholly irresponsible. It doesn't stop there. A, couple, a year ago, it was also made clear that your fact check system is blatantly targeted at conservative newspapers. Do you have any comments on that? Are you aware of the story I'm talking about? I'm not familiar with necessarily the specific story, Congressman. I am aware that from all political viewpoints, we sometimes get uh, questions of this sort. I can say that our fact check labels generally are done algorithmically based on uh, markup and follow up on our policies. Which for the, for the record, they specifically target conservative news media. And oftentimes, they don't even, they have a fact check on there that doesn't even reference the actual article. But Google makes sure that it's right next to it so as to make people understand that that one is questionable even though when you actually read through it, it has nothing to do with it. Um, you know, a few days ago, and this goes to you, Ms. Ms. Burkett, uh, one of my constituents posted photos on Facebook of Republican women daring to say that there are women for Trump. Facebook took down that post right away with no explanation. Is there any explanation for that? Without seeing it, it's hard for me to opine. That doesn't violate our policies, but I'm happy to follow up on the specific example with you. Well, thank you. Listen. Here's what it comes down to. If we don't share the values of free speech, I'm not sure where we go from here. You know, this practice of silencing millions and millions of people, it will create wounds and divisions in this country that we can not heal from. This is extremely worrisome. You've created amazing platforms. We can do amazing things with what, what these companies have created. But 
if we continue down this path, it'll tear us apart. You do not have a constitutional obligation to enforce the First Amendment, but I would say that you absolutely have an obli obligation to enforce American values, and the First Amendment is an underpinning of American values that we should be protecting until the day we die. So thank you, and thank you for indulging me, Mr. Chairman. It was that CPB officers were openly disrespectful of the congressional tour. If officers felt comfortable violating agreements in front of their own management and superiors, that tells us that the agency has lost all control of their own officers. Here now, Republican Congressman Dan Crenshaw of Texas. Congressman, great to have you with us uh, today. You know, first of all, your reaction to that back and forth between the congresswoman and these officers. It's sad to see. She's getting bolder with her lies on this. And, and this is what's actually happening. And this is what the American people need to understand. People like AOC are operating off of a false premise. And it's deliberately designed to misinform the American people for her own political ends, right? Remember, first, there was no crisis at all, okay? Then it was a manufactured crisis. Then it was a crisis completely created by Trump. Then there were concentration camps. Then people are Nazis. Now she's saying that Border Patrol agents harassed her and forced migrants to drink out of toilets. This is insanity. This is not true. There's, there's no one else corroborating this kind of, uh, these kind of reports. And yet she's using it to try and make her case that we shouldn't have any enforcement and that we should have open borders. This is really dishonest behavior from a member of Congress. And yeah. I honestly can't believe it. I mean, Cory Booker said essentially the same thing today, that he wants no holding facilities um, along the border. So I'm not sure exactly where they think everybody is going to go or how that's going to work. Uh, right. Joaquin Castro also running for president. Um, he took a video when he was in there. Let's put that up. Um, he said that this moment captures what it's like for the women who are in custody there. Um, I'm sorry, it, 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 that this is Representative Joaquin Castro, um, who is not running for president, um, but is a representative. And he took this video when he was in there. Obviously, these are very crowded conditions. Also, let's put up now the DHS photos, which were released today by the watchdog agency. Uh, and these are clearly, Congressman Crenshaw, very yeah. overcrowded, very untenable what? situations. Of course, and these Democrats need to have a reasonable, logical conversation, uh, engage in some problem solving, and then offer an actual solution. Because what they're really doing is trying to stand on their moral high horse and, and, and sling arrows at everybody else while not offering a solution. Let's not forget, they fought us tooth and nail against that $4.5 billion of humanitarian aid that the president needed, that DHS needed, that HHS needed in order to better conditions at these facilities. They fought us for months on this. They said there was no crisis. We asked for a vote in the House 17 times. Yeah. They refused to do it. You know, and it's funny, Castro puts this video out. AOC talks about these things. I don't see them offering up any other space in their own homes, right? They're not offering a better solution. They're not saying, hey, why don't we put them all up at a hotel? They don't say that. What they really want is no enforcement. And this is, this is, this is the crux of it. They don't talk about what the actual problem is, which is tens of thousands of people coming across and overwhelming our system, okay? And, and then they have to answer the question, should we have a system at all? And they say no. Well, then what, the, what is the point of even having a border? Why even have customs agents at airports if we're not going to enforce any kind of management over who comes in and out of our country? Yeah, I, I they don't want to answer these tough questions yeah, because right. in the end they want open borders. Yeah, they, I mean, I First on socialism, um, oh, I, I think a lot about why, why that conversation has started to rear its ugly head again. And um, it, it, what I found is, and this is through polling and essentially just talking to people, there's good news and there's bad news, really. Um, the, the good news is that a lot of the people supporting socialism don't know what socialism is. Okay, they think it's something else. They think it's just nice things. They think it's, they think it's what you say if you want to be morally good, if you want to be uh, seen as a generous person, somebody who's thoughtful and does things for others. I've noticed that a little bit. Because in polling, the same people who say they want less government intervention in their lives will also say they're socialists. Okay, so they're not state corporatist socialists. They're not statists. Um, they're something else. And I'll give you an example. I saw this debate between a, a student who was a self-proclaimed socialist and Ben Shapiro, and the student's bringing up an example of a company in Spain that's basically a workers' co-op. Okay, basically the workers share the profits. And he was asked, well, does the state make them do that? And he said, no, it's just what the business, it's their business model. They decided that works best for their business model. Well, okay, well, that's capitalism. That's, that's not, that has nothing to do with socialism, but people are thinking that's socialism, so that's interesting. So 
we always, when we have this debate, we always have to ask the person what they actually mean. Some people think the military, if you have a military, you're a socialist country. No, that's a government program paid for by our taxes. So we always got to dig down into the actual core of the issue. I would say the bad news is that some people legitimately mean socialism. They legitimately mean they want far more government control over your businesses and your lives. Um, and also the bad news is that people aren't being educated correctly. If we're just throwing around definitions and words that used to have meaning and no longer do, well, that's a problem with our education system as well. So that's the bad news. But here's the worst news, in my opinion. I'm, uh, this isn't going to be all bad doom and gloom, mostly, but, <laughs> but not all. Um, he, but he, here's, the, here's the rest of the bad news is, and I think about this more, where, where this trend is coming from. So if, if you're just center of left, um, you, you, tend to be, you tend to be highly focused on inequality. You tend to be focused on inequality and a sense of caring for others. Injustice is a, a word often used. So if you're focused on inequality, like I'm not, for instance. I'm focused on poverty. I think poverty is something that we should care about. And the ability of people to climb the, the economic ladder, I think that's extremely important. But why, why inequality? Well, inequality is a distraction because if you're concerned about inequality, only 50% of your attention is focused on the poor and the rest of it's focused on the rich. There's the resentment for the rich and you can see this pretty much every day in politics. Um, and if you just read Bernie Sanders' Twitter feed, you'll know that there's a deep, and he's leading, by the way, in the Democratic presidential um, uh, primary candidates, candidates. And there is a deep resentment being caused here. This resentment just continues to boil over. And you got to ask yourself, at what point is the inequality acceptable? And that, that's the problem that they never answer. And this is why it's not sustainable. And this is why I would also say that even if it's well-intentioned, even well-intentioned, I would say, liberalism, which there's nothing really wrong with except that they want too much government intervention in our lives, but it's not, it's not malevolent in any way. The problem with that is you have to keep promising more to people to get there. And once you've solved a problem, once you've solved a little bit of injustice or a little bit of inequality, well, you've got to run on something else as a politician, so you've got to solve another thing, and then another thing, and then another thing. And this inevitably keeps piling on upon itself with no real principles guiding that direction. This is progressivism, it's progress at all costs. And so this is what I worry about, because while it's well-intentioned at first and didn't really have anything to do with socialism or true socialism at first, inevitably it has to get there. It has to. You really don't have a choice. And that's what's concerning, because it just builds and builds and builds and builds. And if there's still too much inequality, still too much inequality, well, how are we going to fix that? We need more control. I need to see your payrolls now. I need to see the resumes at everybody who works at a business. I need to make sure that they're getting paid what I think they should be getting paid because I'm the benevolent bureaucrat. This inevitably happens. It might take years or decades, but it will happen with that initial mentality. That's why we fight against it right from the get-go. That's why we start off with principles of free markets and, per and protection of personal property rights and understanding that that's government's role to create the infrastructure and the environment for people to thrive and compete. So we see, we see hierarchies differently. There's a difference in, there's going to be hierarchies in a society no matter what. It's one thing to have them based on merit. It's quite another if you desire to base those hierarchies based on identity. This is the other problem that we're seeing. When you start to pit people against each other in identity politics, it also, I think, inevitably leads to something like socialism. Because what you're doing is you're promising people power over one another. That's effectively what identity politics is. I promise your group power over another group. That's kind of a scary thing. If, if you want something to truly divide us and truly cause resentment in American society and really start ripping us apart, identity politics are a great way to do it. The most interesting thing is, is, is that I've seen the Democratic candidates start to accuse the Republicans of, of identity politics and playing in that game. I don't see how that's remotely true. In any case, it's bad, whether, whether, if, any, if any side does it. And it's, certainly, and it's certainly leading to the divisions that I think we're seeing today. That's my little bit about socialism. What's going on in Congress? Well, are going to really be um, that effective. And of course, arguments are really all we have. Um, 
is there is there another way of of going about this of taking these people who are walking around with iPhones in their hands, hating capitalism, and um, trying to help them understand the nature of the world in which they actually live. Yeah. Um, I, guess, I guess it depends on your definition of arguments. I mean, maybe arguments with a nine-point policy plan aren't yeah. as effective, but rhetorical arguments are. It's all we've got. Like you said, it's all we have. We don't have much else. Um, so there's, there's arguments, I think, in the way that we would make arguments in the way that both of you write about. Um, I, I do think that's effective, um, but you have to fight on the culture war front, you know, and that, that's a whole new world, right? And a lot of my colleagues don't even, they're like, what do you mean by culture war? You know, you, you, you have to fight on this battleground that a lot, of, uh, a lot of the older politicians are not used to fighting on. Um, and maybe a lot of people in this room don't even understand what I'm talking about when I say culture war. So it, it depends on what front of that culture war, but I'll give you one example. Um, you know, there, there's an entire movement in America that just doesn't like America, period, that thinks America is founded on some kind of evil ideology and that it, it should be, and that, that alone is enough to undercut any idea that a conservative, somebody who wants to conserve American ideals, um, is wrong. And so an example of that, you know, and I, I, I shared this, this social media video um, a little while ago. It's a, it's a woman out in California who used to work for the Santa Barbara Community College, and I guess she no longer worked there, and she was upset that when they did hearings, they no longer said the Pledge of Allegiance for whatever reason they had. And uh, she was protesting that uh, as she was testifying to that hearing. And as she, as she was saying her piece and she took up a little flag and said the Pledge of Allegiance, there was protesters there who must have known she was gonna be there and just viciously screamed at her. And she yeah. has tears in her eyes as she's trying to give the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, that's the culture war. Like that, that's the perfect example of this, this and it's, it's vicious, it's gross what's happening. It's a culture of. <laughs> and in the capitalism versus socialism debate, you're right. It's not exactly about arguments and 100 million people dead and whether price controls are a good thing. It is really a culture war deep down. And it's a culture war, which again, go back to how I initially stated this, it is about whether personal responsibility should be valued or whether it should not. 